We've had this thing in for a little while now. Uh, it's the Samsung Galaxy Nexus. This is the latest, the third iteration of the Nexus smartphone from Google. It looks really cool. It's really thin. It's got this kind of sexy curve to it. Uh, feels great in your hand. I can unlock it using my face, um, which is kind of cool. It's incredibly fast. This is the launch vehicle for Ice Cream Sandwich, Android 4.0. Uh, Hardware-wise, this thing is kind of a mixture of really amazing and kind of run-of-the-mill technology. It's the first, uh, like I said, first Ice Cream Sandwich phone. It's got a 720p display uh, on a 4.65-inch screen. It actually doesn't feel huge. Uh, for me, it's it's personally, it's it's borderline too big, uh, but Brian actually is really, really comfortable with it. But 720p, I mean, there are still notebooks today, entry-level notebooks that you can't get with screens that are that high res. Uh, it's just amazing the kind of technology that's going into these mobile devices. And and here's hoping that that all the, the focus on display quality here and in and these tablets will actually spill over into notebooks and, and hopefully desktops as well. But I'm not really here to talk about the hardware. Um, you know, Galaxy Nexus, it's kind of, it launched at an interesting point in time. It was too soon for Google to pick the true next generation platform, for Google to pick Qualcomm's crate, uh, Snapdragon S4. That'll be out here. You know, we've already seen it demonstrated in devices. We'll probably see it shipping sometime in Q2 of this year. Rather than go an entirely uh, another year without, you know, having a Nexus device, I can understand Google's desire to launch early. Then there are all these rumors that Google and NVIDIA really didn't do so well after Tegra 2 and the Honeycomb launch. Uh, and that would explain why Galaxy Nexus launched with a TI OMAP 4460 rather than a Tegra 3. Um, oh, although from a performance standpoint, I, I do believe that that was a bit of a mistake, uh, and I'll get to this shortly. But what I'm here to talk about isn't actually this platform. I want to talk about Android in general. Uh, and I'd like to talk about the mobile landscape. You know, I think there's, I, I've seen a lot of commentary about how Ice Cream Sandwich Android 4.0 is both either, or is either the best version of Android and the one that fixes all of the problems, or I've seen it referred to as kind of lackluster, still not good enough. Um, and I think I finally understand why there's so much debate and why there's so much dissent here uh, when it comes to really how good is this platform. To understand that, I really had to look at all of the players in the space and try and get a good feel for the motivations. You see, if you look at Microsoft or Apple, these are traditional PC companies. When I say PC, I don't mean something that runs Windows. I mean just a personal computer. From their perspective, they've been selling notebooks and desktops for quite a while. And even if you look at Apple, that business is growing for them. They're doing a great job there. As such, their mobile strategy can be a bit different. Whereas if you want a personal computer, if you want something that has the keyboard, has the horsepower, has all of the things that a, a PC or a Mac bring with it, they already have an option to sell you there. Their mobile strategy can be a bit different. They can deliver an, an appliance, something that isn't quite as flexible, something that is much more purpose-focused, uh, that's enhanced by this kind of walled garden uh, app ecosystem. They can do that and get by with it because they're guaranteeing that one way or another, you're going to buy another device from them. You know, if you've got a Windows phone, chances are you've got a PC. And if you've got an iPhone, you've either got a PC or a Mac, and, and Apple would love to sell you a Mac if you don't have one. But it's really this two-device strategy. And, and I believe, at least today in everyone's life, there is room for these two types of devices. Look at it from Google's perspective, however, and things are a bit different. With the exception of Chrome OS, and, and I'll kind of put that to the side because it, it really hasn't uh, taken off in any way, shape, or form, Google doesn't really have a second device to sell you. All that exists is pretty much Android. And I think from Google's perspective, it would love to be in a world where everything that you buy, you know, your two devices, your three devices are all running some form of Google OS. And at one point, that might be Chrome OS plus Android, or at least today, you know, that might just be Android on a couple of different devices. That, that's Google's goal with all of this. And as such, Android can't be this kind of purpose-built purpose appliance. It actually has to be more than that. It has to give you some of what you can get on a PC. It has to give you some of what you can get on a Mac. It has to give you some of that additional flexibility, that more compute-like platform. And I think that's the fundamental difference between Android and iOS, or even Android and Windows Phone. Apple and Microsoft will sell you 
an appliance that's a smartphone. There's some additional flexibility there, but that's it. Google is effectively building a platform here that can be your only computing device. And if you look at kind of the future, the, the next three years for sure, but, but you know, looking in the, the five to seven year range, we're getting to the point where, you know, Adam, for example, that's, that's the thing that was powering, powering netbooks just a couple of years ago. And, and that's a platform that offers uh, the processing power of notebooks from, I don't know, seven or eight years ago. And you're gonna be able to get that kind of performance in a phone. And when you look at Crate, you're gonna have better than that kind of performance in a phone. And then you take Moore's Law and, and you kind of iterate a couple years. And now you're looking at a situation where you have a smartphone that has the power of your laptop from four years ago. Keep iterating out a little further and keep exploiting Moore's Law and you now have a platform that could potentially be good enough for the majority of the mainstream PC users out there. And if you ask Intel, you ask NVIDIA, particularly NVIDIA, they'll tell you that they envision a world where mainstream computing is now done on the smartphone, where your display, you know, you don't give up a massive display, but you connect to it via Wi-Fi direct uh, or, or Wi-Fi display. And you've got a Bluetooth or, or some other form of wireless keyboard and some other form of wireless mouse. And that's your desktop PC, your mainstream, your, your like 399 desktop PC. That's what that is now. And when you're on the go, you don't really need a notebook. You just take it with you. And maybe you go to your office where you also have uh, a Wi-Fi direct display and a wireless keyboard and mouse. Or maybe you get to a hotel room where, again, those things are also there provided for you. And maybe you have some sort of a dock. But either way, that's the kind of vision that these folks have. And again, if you're in Microsoft's camp or if you're in Apple's camp, if that's the future of the world, it's not a big issue because you already, you're in all of those places already. It's just a matter of what form factor is the device that you're selling. But if you're in Google's shoes, you need this platform to kind of service all. And that's really what we see with Android. You know, I was, I was very impressed that Google took a risk when we first saw, saw Holo. That was the, uh, the UI, the theme behind Honeycomb. It was different, you know, it, it kind of fit with the, the whole robot in your device theme of, of Android. But I, I initially wrote it off as an experiment as something that Google wouldn't continue because it's just, it's just different, it's weird, it's not like iOS. And when I first saw Ice Cream Sandwich and Google just repeated the same thing and tweaked it and refined it, I was actually kind of impressed. Uh, not just because I think the theme is perfect, I, I don't think it's perfect, but it gets the job done, it's well executed, but better than ever, it's, it's actually an indication that Google's committed to a UI, it's committed to a theme, and it's going to innovate from here on forward. I think ultimately the people who are disappointed in Ice Cream Sandwich are the folks who wanted it to be iOS but by Google or a more open version of iOS. And that's not what this is. As I just mentioned, Google has a completely different strategy here. They need to build one OS that can scale, presumably from anything from the smartphone all the way to eventually the desktop. And that's what Android is. It's, it's more of a computing environment. It's more of a computing platform. You don't get centralized settings like you do in iOS. You get per app settings, and you also have kind of a, an overall system settings panel. It's subtle things like this that kind of summarize, look, this is more like a PC alternative, PC replacement. It's, it's more PC-like than appliance-like. And if what you were hoping from Ice Cream Sandwich is it, was it for it to be more like iOS, you're going to be disappointed. However, if you were hoping Ice Cream Sandwich would be Android, but better. If you're hoping that it would be smoother and faster with a few new features, that's exactly what it is. You know, one of the biggest issues with Android, you know, since its inception has been the lack of GPU accelerated drawing throughout the OS, particularly in Android 2.x, almost everything that was drawn to the screen was done in software on the CPU. The migration to Honeycomb saw a lot of those SKIA libraries, which are all CPU accelerated. We saw a movement from them to OpenGL ES-based drawing, which leverages the GPU inside the SOC. Again, we weren't at full GPU acceleration in Honeycomb, but with Ice Cream Sandwich, we bring all of the beauty of, of GPU acceleration that was in Honeycomb, plus additional GPU acceleration. So now we're almost entirely going through OpenGL ES drawing, almost entirely accelerated on the GPU on the SOC, and it's just a lot faster. The overall experience is incredibly smooth. And if you look here, you know, if you turn on debug mode with uh, with Honeycomb, uh, sorry, with the, the browser in ICS, 
you can actually toggle on or off OpenGL ES rendering. So what you see here is OpenGL ES rendering turned off, and this is the performance you can actually expect to get under Gingerbread. Now, a lot of the Gingerbread providers uh, or, or, or phone vendors, they you know backported a lot of the Honeycomb stuff into Gingerbread, so you did get smoother experience in this. But if you're running vanilla Gingerbread, this is what you'd get. And now if you turn it on, if you turn OpenGL ES acceleration on, you can see everything is smooth. It's iOS smooth. If that was your biggest complaint about Android, that's effectively fixed. You still have to kind of wait for the third party guys to take advantage of this. Um, there is an actual setting. There are actually a number of great developer options here uh, in Ice Cream Sandwich. But you can force everything to use the OpenGL ES render path. Uh, we've seen some applications that just won't work if you do that. The majority of them do. Uh, those that don't, you know, they're kind of just a recompile and some additional testing away from working perfectly. But this thing is smooth. Like it's, it's just, there's no other way to put it. It's everything that Android was, but better, but smoother, but faster. You know, there are some other additions, things that if you've had a Honeycomb device, if you've had a Honeycomb tab tablet, have now been backported to the smartphone experience as well. You now have a dedicated task switcher. Um, so all the physical buttons are gone off of, uh, off of Android smartphones, and you have three virtual capacitive buttons. You've got back and home. These are traditional. These have been here since, since the early days of Android. And now you have a task switcher button. So this takes the place of, you know, kind of holding down home to bring up recently used apps. Uh, but now you just tap this thing and what you get is a list of your recently used apps. You can quickly switch between them. You can actually quit apps from here if you kind of swipe any of them off of the screen. They're gone, they're loaded out of memory. Um, and it, it's just, it's cleaner, it's nicer. You know, I'd argue it's actually not as fast as you know holding down the home button to, to bring up recently used apps, but it definitely looks nicer. And the fact that you can quit apps from here and, and free up memory for, for example, if you have a, a misbehaving app, that, that's kind of neat. Um, so, so there's that. There's that that's been kind of uh, ported back from Honeycomb. If you look at the browser itself, huge improvements there. Performance is a big thing, uh, but also we get tabbed browsing. Uh, we get the ability to override user agent strings. And we go on to all of this in, in depth in the review itself, but things are just a lot better. All of the first part, first party apps, in fact, are just tremendously better than what they were in Gingerbread. And even compared to, to, to Honeycomb, it's a, just a tremendous improvement. The camera app sees a big boost here, just in usability, it's a lot faster. And, and you're gonna see me uh, reference this a lot in the review itself. Brian goes through this, through this as well. But everything is just smoother. The camera app has, has been tweaked tremendously. The UI makes a lot more sense. It's a lot cleaner. Uh, unfortunately, camera quality on the Galaxy Nexus is kind of average. Um, video record quality, again, average. It's not. It, it's clear that Google and, and Samsung opted to spend a lot of money on the display here um, and not so much everywhere else. You know, it's not bad, but it's it's definitely not the pinnacle of what can be done given available hardware today. Um, but overall, you know, as an OS, this thing is just, it's everything we wanted Android to be. Um, and it's a great starting point for 2012 for Google. You know, other than fully OpenGL ES accelerated drawing, ICS isn't really all that much about introducing new features. It's more uh, uh, evolutionary in terms of what it introduces to the OS. That being said, there are some kind of unique standout features. I kind of mentioned some of the stuff from a browser standpoint. Uh, obviously, we go into more detail in the review itself. Uh, one of the big headlining features is facial recognition. So you can now actually train the device to use the front-facing camera uh, to recognize your face, and, and that's how you can unlock it. Uh, once you train it, you know you can actually improve the, the accuracy of the detection by uh, giving examples of your face in different lighting, with or without glasses. Uh, but once you've got that, you actually get a little window um, at the lock screen and you line up your face with it. And if it recognizes it, it actually works really, really quickly. Um, it is more gimmicky than useful. Uh, unfortunately, you know, if you look at things like uh, using your phone in a dark car at night, for example, it's not going to work too well. Uh, there's always a backup. You know, you can either, get, either give it a pin or a pattern that you can use to unlock. Uh, but it is neat technology. You know, we are... Uh, probably a handful of years away from, from your phone just completely knowing who you are and, and unlocking just when it detects that you're using it. But this is definitely the first step in that direction. Uh, 
Now, if you look at deployment, you know, obviously this has been one of the major issues with every iteration of Android. It takes forever for it to get pushed to other devices. Although this is TI OMAP 4460 based, uh, next to it, I have the ASUS EPAD Transformer Prime. Uh, and this is obviously running Tegra 3 and it's running Ice Cream Sandwich. Um, and that is a port that was done in a matter of days, but you know, it's been polished up over the past month here and, and that's now live. Within the next month, I would expect to see more Tegra 2 based tablets uh, get ICS as well. And I asked a number of companies why things are moving so quickly now. Um, I, I still wouldn't expect everyone to get ICS um, and I wouldn't expect everyone to get it right away. But it looks like things are moving quicker now because if you're a vendor that spent a lot of time backporting Honeycomb that you know is familiar with that code base, familiar with what they need to do to get that running uh, or parts of that running on their hardware, that experience has apparently paid off considerably. Um, and what we've seen is the companies that have done a lot of work there are the ones that are also bringing ICS to market on their devices quicker. The preference is still going to be for the latest and greatest devices to get it first. Um, and we're still hearing about smartphones that are launching with Gingerbread, um, unfortunately, even in, in 2012. But it does look like, unlike the transition to Gingerbread, we will see uh, more devices ship with ICS sooner than we have in the past. Um, and I think a lot of architectures, you know, we've seen it now demonstrated on Qualcomm's architectures, even on Intel, on Atom, you know, they've got ICS running. Uh, and I actually wouldn't be surprised if the majority of the Atom phones that get released in the US will, will debut with ICS as well. Um, and like I said, we're already we're already watching Nvidia deploy it on on its partners' platforms. So in terms of everyone getting access to those OS, I think this is the best story that Google's been able to tell thus far. There is still that kind of lag for everyone else, but hopefully that lag is is getting shorter. Uh, overall, as a platform, you know, as a phone, the Galaxy Nexus is kind of the phone to get today. However, if you're going to lock yourself into a two-year contract. If this is going to be the phone that you're going to keep for a considerable amount of time, our standard recommendation has been to wait. We know crates coming around the corner. Um, I would expect to see the first devices shipping sometime in Q2. Definitely by Q3, you should be able to, Q3 of this year, uh, you should be able to go out and get a really, really good crate based phone. Hopefully, much, much sooner than that. Um, and if you want a Qualcomm alternative, it looks like we'll also see in the second half of this, half of this year, we'll see Intel Atom based phones, which should definitely be faster than anything else that's on the market today in terms of, uh, at least in the Android space. So there are good hardware options coming up. Everyone I think is really standardizing or trying to standardize on the 720p displays. Uh, the other benefit you get if you wait is you'll have some 28 nanometer LTE, uh, modems out there, which will improve LTE battery life. Uh, again, if you go crate, you'll also be able to get the option of having an integrated LTE baseband into your SOC, uh, which is, of course, better for battery life. Um, and, and I just think those are fairly uh, up and coming platforms that aren't too far away that if you don't have to have a phone today, those are the ones to wait for. Um, you know, Google, you can't really fault them for wanting to launch this at the end of last year. You want to have something new every year. I totally get it. But as a consumer, if you're going to wait, uh, if you have the ability to wait, you'll you'll definitely appreciate what comes out as a result. Uh, otherwise, today, you know, the, the, the typical conclusion to any major Android launch is this is the best Android phone yet. Uh, the benefit that this has going for it right now is the Galaxy Nexus obviously ships with Ice Cream Sandwich. Much, much better if you uh, much, much better than Gingerbread. If you haven't touched Honeycomb, it's going to feel like a revolution to you. If you have, it's just going to feel like a very tweaked version of Honeycomb in, in a very, very good way. We go into a lot more detail, a lot more depth on the phone. Brian does an amazing job just going through, looking at the baseband, um, addressing some of the issues that people brought up about that. He does a great job looking at the display. Uh, despite the fact that this is Pentel based, you actually can't tell. Um, it's, a, it's an excellent screen. We go into all of that. We go into more detail on ICS as well in the full review at anontech.com. And I've included that in the notes here uh, in the channel. So. If you can, check out the review. That'll give you a lot more detail on all of this. As always, thank you for watching and take care.